This is the question that we are going to address in just a moment, provide you an answer for it. The question is, the Aspergian mind, the Aspie, are we different from those on the autism spectrum? I mean, significantly different. Should we have our own category? And if so, why? What is the determ What is the determining factors that draw that conclusion? We're going to answer that question in just a moment. Suffice it to say, in the meantime, that my name is Ken, and uh, I am approaching my 70th birthday. And over seven decades, nearly seven decades, I've learned a thing or two, and I just want to share with you some of those things I've learned, because I have lived with Asperger syndrome my entire life. That's a very, very long time, relatively speaking. So wherever you are in life, chances are, unless you're over 70 years old, I've been there and done that. I've had similar experiences, and I just want to share some of those things with you. What we're talking about today is the fact that the people with Asperger's syndrome tend to have advanced verbal skills. And I like to put things in the context of um, analogy simply because it makes it easier to understand. So I want you to think of a warehouse. What are some of the things that you put in a warehouse? Well, have you ever thought of a silo as a warehouse? It is because what you warehouse in a silo is grain. Well, let's supposing that you are uh, somebody who sells cars and you buy a lot of cars and you got to put them somewhere so you put them on a lot. Well, you can think of a car lot as a warehouse, but then again, you might want to park them indoors. So it's a warehouse for cars. What's that have to do with advanced verbal skills? Well, this. I believe that uh, the Aspie brain is a warehouse of words. Our brains are repositories of terminology. How so? How did we get there? Well, I don't know, but I think I've got some really good ideas. The first idea is because we tend to be listeners. So stop and think about it. Notoriously, people with Asperger's syndrome tend to be perceived as a little bit shy or timid or withdrawn because we tend to sit back and absorb and we listen. I know there are exceptions. I know there are people with Asperger's syndrome, quite frankly, they just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, but they are not, uh, they're not the norm. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but they're just not the norm. So the reason I say that is because we listen, we tend to absorb. We are bringing things in more than putting things out, so as they come in, they tend to collect. That includes words. So I say that the Aspie brain is a warehouse of terminology. So if you have all these words collected in your mind, there's going to come times when you're having conversations and speaking where you are going to draw upon the terminology that is warehoused in your brain so you can adequ adequately express yourself. There is a challenge to that, and that is that sometimes, well, oft times, people don't really expect you to use terminology that uh, is not uh, commonly used. Well, sometimes we even use words that they don't even know what they mean. And even if we use familiar words, a lot of people, well, why would you use that particular term? Because, quite frankly, it's more expressive. It better, accurate, more accurately, I should say, communicates the thought that we have in our minds. So we absorb, we listen, we have a repository of words, and when those words are needed, we have them, even though some people may find that a little bit peculiar, particularly if the person speaking is a child. So you have this little kid, little cute Aspergian kid, and he is using the same terminology that you would expect of a middle-aged adult. Now, that could be a problem, but oftentimes it is a very positive thing. It's a superpower because adults like to talk to children who can communicate effectively. And so you've got this little kid who is communicating like an adult. And so the adult enjoys having a conversation with this little child because they are able to understand each other very, very well. Again, that is a superpower. So I've got this theory that uh, one of the reasons that we tend to be repositories of terminology of advanced verbal skills is because we are listeners. But that's just my hypothesis. But I think there is even a more, more probable reason to explain why we have advanced verbal skills, and I think that is genetics. 
we inherited the trait from our ancestors, passed down by way of our parents. In other words, we are wired to be repositories, to be warehouses of terminology. It's, again, genetic. Now, this is kind of interesting, in my opinion, because it has actually, oh, by the way, I've got to say, you know, you don't have literal wires in your brain. Okay, I don't have to say that, do I? No, of course not. Everybody knows that, particularly in the age of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. We don't have literal wires. It's, again, an analogy. All right, what about this genetic causation? Yes, it is obviously there. How do we know? We know that because of research, because of studies. Simple comparisons. Now we're going to dig into the answer to the question that we presented at the onset of this presentation. Using an EEG, that is an electroencephalogram, that is where, okay, we were talking about wires. This is a real world example. In case you don't know what an EEG is, and I've taken a couple of these, uh, years ago, I had brain surgery after I fell off a ladder, but they hooked up my brain or my head with these wires. They had these little nodes they put all over my, my head, and they could read my brain waves. They could literally see my brain waves on, uh, on a screen. All right, now supposing you were able to see somebody's brain and determine whether or not they had Asperger's syndrome. And the answer is yes, they can, they can look at your brain activity and they can say this person is different from the neurotypical population. Now here's what's interesting about that is they not only compared people diagnosed with uh, Asperger's syndrome with the neurotypical population, but they also compared us with those in the general overall autism population. And what they found was this. They discovered that when they compared us with the general population, they could determine who was and who was not an Aspergian 96.2% of the time. That's, in my opinion, a fairly accurate. But what happened when they compared us, Aspergians, to the uh, overall autism population? Well, again, this time the accuracy rate was 92.3% of the time. So the answer to the original question is, yes, we are a subset of, a very distinguishable, I should say, subset in the autism spectrum population overall, and it's been scientifically validated through studies, through research using EEGs. So how was the study conducted? Well, I can put a link in the uh, description section below so you can see all this in proper context, but basically with a controlled ASD dichotomy, an ASB population falls closer to ASD than controls. That sounds really technical, doesn't it? However, when compared directly with ASD, an ASP population is distinctly separate. ASP, that's being us, Aspergians. So we say that we are wired for words. This time I'm not going to say that they're, that they're not literal wires. Because an EEG, hey, those are literal wires. Okay, they're not our wires, but they're wires nonetheless. And they do determine, uh, they don't cause us to be, obviously, they don't cause us to have this enhanced ability, this advanced skill set for retaining uh, terminology, but they do validate that that is a distinguishable factor with people with, uh, for people with Asperger's syndrome. So we're wired for words. So if I understand the uh, study correctly, the study concludes that we are more akin to autism than we are to neurotypical people. So we are clearly in the, um, aut on the autism spectrum. But when compared to those with autism, Aspies clearly stand out as a unique subset, a group of our own. So, a scientific study has concluded that the Aspergian population is wired differently. It could be that our brains are wired to adapt more extensive vocabulary than others. The reason I kind of pause here is I just noticed a typo. 
Those should be our, not our. I need to go back and fix that. So, one more time. I'm not even going to read this sentence. What about our language? All right, let's talk about this for a second. This is from a, uh, an article that was titled, The Discovery of Aspie Criteria. It is attributed to the famed Tony Atwood. I assume you know who he is. And Carol Gray. And in this article, I found this very valuable information. By the way, the, the thing I like about this article, it is so concise. It's like you take an entire book of information and you reduce it down to a four-page article. It is extremely useful in my opinion. All right, so within the article, we find this. Fluent in Asperges. That is the language of Aspergia. Now, if you are an Aspie, you may not have known that we have our own language. Well, not really, but we tend to use, again, terminology that is not typically used by typical people, which is why they call them typical people, I suppose. This is a social language characterized by at least three of the following. Let's take a look at these five very, very quickly. Number one is a determination to seek the truth. So people with uh, Asperger's syndrome, we'll do a video on this, standalone video on this, but people with Asperger's syndrome tend to be idealist. I don't know about you, but uh, I am a, uh, an idealist to a fault. I get myself in trouble. I have this, um, I have this, uh, what? Okay, I've got a repository for words, and I can't think of one when I need it. But I have this, oh, penchant, that'd be a good word. I have this penchant for anti-racism. That, my friend, will get you in trouble. All right, number two is this. Conversation free of hidden meaning or agenda. That is, we tend to be up front. We, we call a spade a spade. We just see things in black and white. Remember those old 1950s uh, westerns? Maybe you're not old enough, but you can find them on YouTube. The good guys wore white hats and the bad guys wore black hats. They were very eagle, easily distinguished. Well, that's the way our brain works. Our brains are white hats and black hats. We think of the villain who has the, uh, the dark mustache, the wily mustache, and we have the clean shaven, I don't know why, good guy in the white hat. That's the way our thinking works. We can tell the difference, and we love to tell the difference. We just can't help it between good and evil. Number three is an advanced vocabulary and interest in words. That is why I included this segment in our presentation. Because a part of our language as Aspies is we have advanced vocabulary, and that is understood by Tony Atwood. And I don't know of any person on the planet, maybe there are some, who is more familiar with the workings of uh, autism and Asperger's syndrome specifically than Tony Atwood. Atwood. Let's take a look at two more points here. Number one is a fascination with word-based humor such as puns, and number five is advanced use of pictorial metaphors. I think I started out doing that, didn't I, when we were talking about warehouses and we talk about wiring. Those are metaphors, or I like to call them analogies, but basically we're talking about the same thing. So we have this advanced use of analogy. So there you have it. Among the so-called superpowers that uh, are expressed by people with Asperger's syndrome, that sometimes, or Asperger's syndrome, if you prefer, is this uh, amazing ability for us to be able to maintain a repository of terminology. And it comes in very useful because it helps to make us good communicators. So if you want to know what we're thinking from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you want to know what we're thinking, uh, we will tell you that's providing, that's providing that uh, you, you can get us to talk.